Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, just a quick reminder, this is the end of the quarter, last week before the end of the quarter. So all the assignments uh, for this week will be pushed to be the beginning of quarter two. So on the last slide, you'll notice that there's a little note that basically says that all these things will basically show up on quarter two. And I kind of gave a little bit later due date. It'll be due like next week, Wednesday, um, to be sure that it only shows up in the grade book for quarter two. So we're going to jump right into the notes. They're not very long today, so we'll get started. I just, uh, one thing that you should be aware of, keep in mind, um, and I've mentioned this before, that uh, when we're studying ecology, there's lots of overlap. So some of the things that we've already discussed kind of comes up again and in different ways. And we pointed out um, looking at it from different viewpoints. So if you come across a part of the notes where, where you're like, hey, Mr. Schultz already talked about that. Um, during uh, the last set of notes, well, that's intentional. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of repetitiveness and, and redundancy kind of built into um, these lessons, okay? So uh, we're still on ecosystems, environmental health, and interactions. We're module two, lesson two, and I'll let you read through the um, learning objectives off to the side. You'll be able to see them a little bit better on, on Canvas. You won't have my uh, video picture kind of in the way of those last few. And then we are looking at specifically today ecosystems and environmental change, okay? So quick introduction, population size will grow unchecked unless there are limited resources acting on the population. And we talked about this during the last unit. We talked about population size and limiting factors and exponential growth and logistic growth and all those different things. So ecosystems are areas where populations live, including all the abiotic factors as well as the living organisms. And changes in that ecosystem can have an impact on the size of the populations that are living there. Um, if we change how much food's available, for example, in a particular ecosystem, that's going to change the carrying capacity of that ecosystem, so it'll change the population size. So in this lesson, we'll explore how the environment can impact ecosystems and populations, how changes and natural fluctuations and sometimes unnatural fluctuations of the ecosystem can actually reduce or even increase the amount of limited resources available to the organisms and that change would obviously impact the population size depending on how dramatically the resources change so typically ecosystems are stable and able to withstand major changes due to fluctuations of the biological and physical conditions acting on them they tend to be stable because of complex interactions of all the organisms and the abiotic factors that make up the ecosystem. So one of the things that's gonna come up that we've talked about before is going to be secession, which is basically a change in ecosystem. We talked about primary secession and secondary secession, kind of introduced it, and we'll go into a little bit more detail with this set of notes. So a quick review, limited resources such as food, shelter, and mating partners are all factors that can limit population size. We've discussed this before. How species interact with other species can also play an important role in population size. Predator-prey relationships, for example, usually keep each other's population from getting too big or too small. Um, abiotic indicator and biotic factors that limit growth of population size are also part of what makes up the ecosystem. So the needs of the organisms can vary, but they can be generalized with the list that we're going to see on the next couple slides. So for animals, typically, you know, you think of a uh, what animals need to survive, and you have food and water and shelter space or habitat, um, suitable temperature, um, availability of mates to reproduce. And then you got a similar list with plants. It might be slightly different because plants obviously don't eat things, but they do need access to light to make their own food, water, minerals in the soil, um, carbon dioxide from the air, uh, space to grow, and the ability to reproduce. And that could actually include some biotic factors when we start talking about plants um, flowering plants for example need pollinators like bees or or hummingbirds or something like that that visit their flowers biodiversity is a major aspect of ecosystem health and we talked about that that was one of your questions in one of the unit tests um, a pretty important one uh, the more diverse an ecosystem is the better chance it has of surviving the fluctuations and changes that it undergoes so that kind of covers the review and introduction parts. So let's jump into what we're really going to focus on. I'm gonna actually come over here and uh, make my picture a little bit smaller just so I'm not, not in the way of some of those words because I know there's some stuff that's on the other page or on the other side. Uh, remember, biodiversity is the sum total of all the different species in an ecosystem. It could also include genetic diversity, ecosystem diversity, all those things in, are included in biodiversity. 
Basically, the more diverse or higher the number of different species, the healthier the ecosystem is going to be. It enables it to be more resilient to changes due to fluctuations impacting an ecosystem. Being more resilient simply means that the ecosystem will have less of a chance of a disruption causing a major change or a collapse within the ecosystem. Um, so if they look at the image to the right, that's kind of showing a coral reef, right? Shows lots of biodiversity, all different types of fish, as well as the corals themselves and other organisms that might be living in this area, including all the abiotic factors like water and the, the uh, um, rocks and different things that the coral might be growing on, etc. Okay. So a couple quick examples, and this is, this is kind of why I wanted to move my picture, so let me move myself over here. Some examples of disruption include seasonal and non-seasonal flooding. Uh, you have drought. Um, earthquakes could be a, a disruption. Volcanic eruptions are disruptions. Hunting are um, uh, considered disruptions to ecosystems. Uh, fire, like a forest fire, something like that, wildfire. And then rising sea levels. Now, all of those are just a small sampling of the different types of disruptions we could have. Um, there's others as well. This isn't a comprehensive list. I'm just giving you a few examples. So what could that what could that cause? And that, that's where you have to look over on the right side. So these disruptions to an ecosystem can actually cause several different effects on the ecosystem. Um, it can affect the organism type. For example, the types of organisms that are living in an ecosystem might change. If we change the pH of a certain um, body of water, for example, it becomes a little bit more acidic or more basic then the types of fish that are living in that ecosystem could actually change over time. And it could happen one of a couple ways. The fish could simply leave and other fish could come in. Um, so you got immigration and emigration occurring. Or we're going to see down toward the bottom when we get to number five, they could actually kind of change or become or evolve and become a new species. Um, number two, uh, the population numbers could change. Reduction or increase of the size of the population could occur. And you could have it go either direction. You could have, you know, an increase in the numbers of organisms or a decrease, depending on what that disruption might do to that particular ecosystem and how um, suited those organisms might be to survive in that ecosystem. You have extinction. Species could um, no longer exist. I think I gave an example in class. Um, there's a certain species of fish that lives, lives over in some of the uh, water areas of ash meadows over by Pahrump. And they're only found there. I think there's um, similar... Uh, situation in Death Valley where there's only um, that that's the only place that these organisms live so if something were to happen to their small area um, in which they survive that would cause a major disruption um, it might cause that species to actually go extinct and then you got migration I mentioned this species could leave and new ones could be introduced um, and then you also have speciation where where species might develop into a new um, species of organism through the process of natural selection. And we'll get more into detail of evolution and natural selection um, later in the year. All right. So i uh, move myself back out of the way here. So there's two different categories of fluctuations that impact ecosystems. You have moderate and extreme. Moderate fluctuations are events that cause relatively small impacts on the ecosystem. And there's a there's a cool little activity that uh, you're going to look look at in Canvas where you kind of click and drag what would be considered a moderate, what would be considered an extreme fluctuation. Um, and you'll see that, and it's um, right next to a similar picture like this one here um, in the Canvas uh, um, module. Okay, So a good example, though, would be deer hunting in Michigan. This causes a small reduction in the deer population during the hunting season. And this is enforced by the government. They allow a certain number of tags and so on, and it's kind of monitored and controlled. Um, and the reason for this, actually, the reason for this is it actually helps the habitat in some ways. If, if we didn't change or harvest a certain number of deer in Michigan, for example, then there would be too many deer for the availability of food, especially during the winter mo months where food is scarce, and you'd have a whole bunch of deer that would basically starve to death. So the government figures it's better that some hunters go out there and harvest them and use them as a food source um, instead of them starving to death and all that going to waste. So that's a small, uh, short-term, uh, moderate type of uh, fluctuation that could occur um, that would reduce the deer population. 
This is only a short-term effect as the deer population is able to replenish itself by the following year. On the other hand, a major or um, extreme fluctuation would be something like a volcanic eruption, like the one pictured to the, it says left, but it should be on the right, and is an example of an extreme fluctuation because it would cause major damage to an ecosystem and it could take years, decades, or even centuries for an ecosystem to recover from one of these extreme fluctuations. All right, so what is ecological secession? We kind of went through this. This is the part where I said we kind of introduced it before, and now we're going to come, kind of come back to it and go into a little bit more detail. So this is revisited. That's why I wrote revisited. We're coming back to it. So ecological secession is what happens to an ecosystem over time. And we talked about it before. We talked about primary and secondary, and we'll go back over what those are. But it basically explains an ordinary set um, of orderly changes that occur within the structure of an ecosystem. So... We could use a person or a plant or an animal or something like that as an example. Um, so one example of secession in your life could be as follows. You're born. You learn to crawl. Eventually you learn to walk. And then maybe you learn to run. As you continue to grow older, your body goes through certain predictable changes over a period of time. You become taller. Your hair grows longer. Your mind and body develops and so on. Same is true for plants. You plant a tree and slowly it kind of grows. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually you have a full size tree, right? So this is essentially what ecological secession is, except it's on a much larger scale. And it's not looking at a single organism. It's looking at an entire ecosystem. They go through these predictable steps or stages as they kind of develop and mature. So it is a predictable set of changes that are visible over a period of time, and the time scale can be decades or even, in some cases, hundreds or thousands or millions of years. It can take a long time for these things to kind of develop. So let's look at primary secession first, and I used a similar picture when we introduced this. Actually, I think I used the exact same one, um, and that's on purpose because I wanted you to be familiar with it. So primary secession, this is when an ecological community first enters into a new form of habitat. Um, it's never been there before, and it usually is going to develop on bare rock. So if you look at this, this is time, right? This is at the beginning. We had bare rock, and we're moving forward in time as we go to the right. And it shows the different types of species and stuff, okay? So during primary secession, you have, let's say you have new rock that formed. It could be a volcanic rock that just kind of developed um, from an eruption or whatever, or a landslide could expose a bare piece of rock. This rock is altered and changed into soil. This is the part, notice this says hundreds of years down here, centuries. This is the part right here, probably these first couple stages here, are the part that takes the longest. It takes a long time for rock to break down into soil. That takes hundreds, if not thousands, or longer for that to happen. So the rock is altered and changed into soil, and it becomes a new habitat. This process is done this uh, breaking down of the rock is done by these organisms called pioneer species. And some examples of pioneer species would be lichens and mosses. And a lot of it is mechanical weathering and, and, and different things like that, freezing and warming of temperatures that would split the rock because there's trapped moisture um, due to these lichens and mosses and, and things like that, as well as chemical um, uh, decomposition. So the pioneer species are basically the first to colonize the previously disrupted area and then the environment then grows after that. So once we start getting soil showing up, now we can start having some annual plants and things like that move in there. Eventually you move into um, grasses and perennials, and then as the soil gets richer, you might start having shrubs and small trees, and then eventually you end up with an entire uh, forest ecosystem. Okay, And that's usually called a climax community, and we'll come back to that. So what's secondary secession then? Now if you look down here, you notice that um, this picture is showing it happening in a relatively short period of time. Instead of centuries moving this way, we're looking at this kind of getting to that third and fourth stage within a few years. So secondary secession is basically what happens after a habitat has been established, but then there's a disturbance in some way. So there's some kind of change. It could be a flood or whatever. In this case, it's showing a fire, right? So an ecosystem kind of burns down. So this, in this example, the habitat grows on disturbed, then there's a forest fire, it burns and changes a portion of the habitat that has been growing, and that ecological habitat now has to enter a secondary secession stage. Um, usually after this, 
you don't have to have, wait these hundreds and hundreds of years for soil to be there because the soil is already present. As a matter of fact, sometimes these fires actually add nutrients to the soil and make it even more fertile. So this change can happen in a relatively short period of time. You'll start having annual plants move in relatively quick, then grasses, and next thing you know, before you know it, you have shrubs and small trees, and you're back to a climax community probably within several decades, about 150 to 200 years or so. Um, you can be back to where you were before instead of thousands of years or even millions of years. All right, so what's this climax community we keep talking about, right? A climax community is basically the last stage of ecological secession. It's when the ecosystem has uh, become balanced. There's little risk of an interfering event or change that are, is going to mutate the environment. Um, several rainforests, certain deserts would qualify as being in the climax stage. Ecosystems in this stage are generally very large, they're very genetically diverse, and they have a large number of organisms. And being genetically diverse is important because it usually means that the populations of all these organisms will have a high resiliency to withstand any environmental changes. So if there's a, you know, a drought for a period of time, usually it can survive that. It does fairly well. You might have some organisms dying off, but there's going to be some that are going to be resistant to those drought conditions because they have some genetic diversity. Uh, so this can limit the amount of damage that's going to be done to the ecosystem if a fluctuation does occur. All right, that's it, guys. It, we, I, I told you it would be quick. So I'm going to go over a couple things um, as far as the assignments. Remember, this is that note I was talking about. All will be counted in quarter two. So all of these assignments are going to show up in quarter two. You still have to make sure you do all the self-checks in module two, lesson two. Watch all the videos. I think there's two or three. Uh, videos in module two lesson two and then um, module two 2.4 assignment is basically a response to those videos I think you watch two videos and then there's a couple writing responses uh, just do that it's worth about 10 points and then you have 2.5 which is the ecosystem change review and then 2.6 looks at PICAs in their environment and it's um you'll have to watch a video there's a, like a little YouTube video in there on um, that kind of introduces what they are Follow the instructions for this. Um, keep in mind that in a, in a couple of these assignments, some of you guys have been asking, there's sometimes a spot where it asks you to share with a partner. If you find a partner um, that's in one of your classes or something and you want to email back and forth and discuss the results of these, um, I highly encourage that. But if you can't, I understand through distance learning that's difficult sometimes. So it's no big deal. If you can't do that, just kind of answer the questions that you are able to do and, and don't worry about the group work or partnering work that you have to do. Um, just kind of turn it into an individual portion. All right, guys, make sure you guys come to office hours if you need help with any of these uh, during the week, especially on Wednesdays and then in the afternoons on, for you guys, uh, Tuesdays and Fridays. And I'll be glad to help you. Um, we have one more lesson after this for this module, and then we will have another unit test. All right, guys, have a great day.